Lucky to have Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the Hall of Famer, all-time leading scorer, joining us in the Man Cave. Coming up next week at uh, 10 Eastern, that's November 3rd, 10 Eastern, HBO will be airing Kareem, Minority of One, a documentary focusing on the life and career of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. First of all, welcome. Oh, thank you. Uh, what do you want us to learn that we didn't know with this documentary? Well, just uh, some of my motivations for the stances I, that I took and uh, what was going on in my head when I, I did certain things. I, I wasn't very keen on sharing too much <laughs> with the uh, with the press because uh, sometimes I, I felt that they were out to make me look bad. So uh, I, I was very cautious. I was too cautious. But uh, that was something that um, more or less uh, Coach Wooden kind of put that in our heads. Uh, he didn't let us talk to the press. Uh, severely limited our access to the press. He, he felt that uh, they were a nuisance. So I kind of took that attitude with me when I came into the NBA, and that did not uh, serve me very well. But did it? So it stunted your your media growth by going to UCLA. I don't, uh, I don't think it stunted my growth, but um, it just made me uh, suspicious and cautious with the media, and I. I maintain that attitude for way too long. I got to work. Those are people that you have to work with uh, when you're a professional athlete. And if you don't do it, um, it's bad for you. It's uh, bad for your sport. Bill Walton wasn't afraid to voice his opinions later on in his career at UCLA. Would How outspoken would you have been at UCLA? Looking back, given those those times when you were there. I was kind of outspoken, but I, you know, I, I wasn't on any kind of crusade. But for example, um, when uh, Dr. King was assassinated, uh, there was a demonstration at UCLA. I, I participated in it. We just lined up on Bruin Walk. And uh, people uh, uh, challenged me. They said, well, you're going to get a chance to play in the NBA and make a lot of money. You shouldn't be out here protesting. Uh, really? Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's no way that those two things uh, correlate. But uh, that, that was the attitude that uh, we had to contend with uh, from the average uh, American. But I always found that you, as great as you were as a player, you were even more fascinating as a person. There was so much there. But what part of you says, I, I do want to share that. I just don't know if I can trust people that I want to share it when you were playing. I, I think it, for me it was uh, if I understood that the, uh, the correspondent had some personal an integrity and I respected his work, I, I'd, I'd open up and, and talk with them. Uh, if I didn't, I, I'd be more cautious. And um, sometimes uh, they would make statements or try to try to bait me, and I, I wasn't going for that. You know, I, it, it would get into uh, uh, it would get contentious. You know, is there any correlation between height and personality? What you share and don't share, shyness. Um, if if you're six three instead of seven two, are you different? I, I think so because. Uh, when you're exceptionally tall, or any, if you stand out in any way, um, it, it kind of puts you inside. It pushes you inside because uh, people single you out, and then uh, you feel you have to defend yourself, or you have to avoid being singled out, and uh, it, it gets complicated. Did you feel obligated to play basketball? No, I I, I like playing basketball. But I, was baseball a first love? Baseball definitely was first love, but uh, the, the fastball wouldn't go over the plate <laughs> with any regularity. Wait, you were a pitcher? Yeah, I, I, I could throw it really hard, but I, I didn't have Randy Johnson as a role model. <laughs> See, that's, I needed him, you know, that you know, tall guys could, could pitch. You Did know, you we, play in high school? No, I didn't play. I, I stopped, and uh, I could have played in high school because the basketball coach was the baseball coach in my high school. And he said, do you want to pitch? You can come out. And I, I said, no, I'm going home every day. So I, I just stopped playing baseball at that point. But I, I, that, that's always the game that I loved uh, the most. 1963 was a great year. The, the, the Dodgers swept the Yankees. I, I got to get rag everybody for like two months after the World Series was over. Because you're living in New York, and so you had the Yankee fans and then you being a Brooklyn Dodger fan. And the Giants fans, very obnoxious people. <laughs> Still to this day, you know? So, yeah. How, what role did Jackie Robinson play in your life? Jackie Robinson played a big role in my life. He was, he was a role model when I was a kid. My mom pointed him out to me uh, that he was articulate and intelligent and you should be like him. I ended up going to UCLA. Um, Where he went? Yeah, yeah. it was uh, 
uh, he was a great role model, though. I, I really appreciate the things that he stood for and the stances that he took. It, it really made a lot of sense. He helped start a, a, a black-owned bank in, in Harlem. I, I went up there with my $17 and put it in the bank, you know. <laughs> he, he was just, uh, you know, somebody that I admired so much and uh, saw a, a lot of leadership there. But how difficult, and you face this, to turn the other cheek when something happens on the court or in life that Jackie was able to somehow do that? Jackie was able to do that, but Jack was, uh, he was very good at getting his, getting his, his word in. He, he often uh, would challenge guys to meet him under the stands <laughs> between innings, and they were like, no, I'm not going to do that, you know. So, uh, you know, Jack, Jack. Jack fought back, and um, you know, as time went on, uh, people accepted him. I, I had a chance to uh, get to know Ernie Banks uh, just right before he died, the, the last part of his life, yeah. uh, and uh, he was telling me that, that Jackie really helped him by uh, advising him and telling him how to conduct himself uh, and uh, you know avoid uh, incidents and you know come off being the class guy that he was. We're talking to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the HBO special, so you know it's great. Kareem, Minority of One, November 3rd at 10 Eastern and uh, 10 Pacific documentary focusing on the life and career of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Did you ever get bored scoring? No, no. You know, I, I never got bored uh, in any parts of the game because I, I enjoyed winning. The guys I played with enjoyed winning. Uh, they enjoyed the fact that I helped them win a lot of games. Uh, it was uh, a mutual support but you were so good at the sky hook i i just i didn't know if it got to the point where like tiger woods has reinvented himself like he had broke down his swing a couple of times and he wanted to be even greater like did you did you ever assess your game and say well i've got this down now what do i want to do differently yeah i would work on different parts of my game uh as my career proceeded i remember one uh once off season, I went to Pete Newell and asked him, you know, a few questions about what was happening, and he explained to me why certain guys that played very physical had an advantage. I needed to strengthen up, so I got in the weight room. So the last four or five years that I played, they couldn't push me around. It, it really uh, lengthened my career. If somebody didn't see you in the '60s at UCLA, how would you describe? you in a sentence or so uh very, i had a I had a great time at ucla doing everything uh going to class was great playing basketball was great I got to go to football games and there were co-eds i'd gone to <laughs> all boys school so power memorial was an all boys it was school? all boys school so i got out to ucla and <laughs> the co-eds at ucla are stunning you know it was i wasn't leaving there you know <laughs> but Okay, I'll fill in for Kareem. He's the most dominating. Do you think Michael Jordan was dominating? Kareem changed the game. Well, Lou Alcindor changed the game. And uh, it, it felt like those teams were so good, so polished. And to understand the science of basketball, how important was that? That Coach Wooden was teaching you something more than just play basketball. There, were, there was a lot more going on with his teachings. He was teaching us the, the secrets of success, and uh, he was teaching us how to be for real in terms of living up to your commitment, and your commitment to the team, uh, the commitment to your teammates, uh, the program, and your, yourself, your own goals. And he wanted us all to graduate and learn how to be uh, good citizens, good parents, good husbands. That, that, that's what he wanted us to learn, and basketball was just a means to that end for him. I was amazed to go to his apartment and how modest a life Coach Wooden led. And, and he, would, he would do his interviews out in the courtyard, and then if he thought, not you were worthy, but if he liked you, he would let you inside. And this was after his wife died, Nell, and, and we, I sat in there for three hours. And he just was opening his scrapbook and just talking because he understood. I I was asking him about reserves on UCLA's team. Right. You know, Larry Hawley. I mean, I'm 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 throwing out Swin Nader and you know all these names there. And he knew that Lynn Shackelford and Kenny Heights. He knew that I loved the program. And for three hours, he made me a sandwich, and he just talked. And part of me felt sad 
But then I, I don't know why. I don't know why I felt that way towards the latter part of his life. Uh, the, the sadness that you noticed was the fact that um, Nell had died and he was alone. Uh, that was his partner and uh, he really missed her. So when the guys, when we would come around and, yeah. and uh, distract him and uh, talk to him about various things, uh, he, he really enjoyed that. Uh, beginning every baseball season, we'd get together and say, all right, uh, who's gonna do well and who isn't? Uh, he knew I was a big baseball fan, so uh, we, we really enjoyed that. What were the playgrounds like back in the 60s here in New York City? Playgrounds were like uh, um, basketball as a blood sport. <laughs> you mentioned playing at the cage on, on West 4th Street. Yeah. It, it was like that more or less uh, anywhere you played in, in the city. It's not like that now. It's, uh, it's become very, um, very placid and calm game. They just, all the kids just want to shoot three-pointers and, and talk about that. <laughs> you know? But what was it like when you showed up to play? Uh, it was get the best guys out because uh, we, we have a challenge. And uh, The guys that I played with, we played uh, in northern uh, Manhattan and up in Harlem. And we, we played in Queens and Brooklyn. we go out to the beach and play, come down uh, to lower Manhattan and uh, and challenge people uh one of the guys in my neighborhood used to uh make bets on the side and uh if we won he'd put fifty dollars in our pocket that that was a lot of money in 19, <laughs> 1962 you know best guy you played against on the playground jeez um earl monroe really oh yeah uh new york played philly and the baker league played the rucker so uh i played on the New York team, this is between my senior year in high school and my first year at UCLA. So is Earl with the Bullets then? Er, uh, yeah. He, or is he in college at Winston-Salem? He was, he was in college at Winston-Salem. Okay. But he played in the Baker League for the summer. So the Baker League All-Stars played the Rucker All-Stars. So, and I didn't know who he was. And he had his own cheering section. <laughs> he came out and there were people running around talking about, Jesus, Jesus. And I'm like... <laughs> Wait, Wait he was the first black Jesus? He, that I know of. <laughs> so he comes out and he has on a white low cut and a black high top. <laughs> and um, the game starts, and I, I didn't start the game, but he, the game starts and he's doing all this weird stuff with the ball. He hasn't even cro crossed half court. And then he jumps up in the air and throws a, a pass with top spin. It goes three quarters of the court, hits the ground, and catches somebody in in stride that catches it and lays it up. I was like, oh, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to have a game today. You know? <laughs> Plus, he, he just had a great handle. He could and handle he, it and he could shoot it. Uh, you know, just out, lights out, he could shoot it. Uh, not with the range of uh, Stephen Curry, but he, he had good range and uh, great ball handling skills. But they, did they want a piece of you, though? Like, there's always the guy on the playground that's, that, that's trying to dunk over you. Right. You but, got that? Yeah, but I, I didn't let that happen. <laughs> I, I was uh, at that Ever? point. No, I, I kind of dealt with that. At my first year uh, <laughs> playing varsity basketball, ninth grade, I got run over a couple of times. And then after that, it was oh, those days were over. I saw you play Walton in Walton's first game in Dayton, Ohio, preseason. And I knew Bill was in a little, like there was that learning curve mm -hmm. when, when that, that first happened. But did, what did you see when you saw Walton? Here's a guy who went to UCLA and, you know, were you seeing something different at that position? Well, I, I, Bill was a consummate team player and understood the, the team game. He's a good passer, had a, had a good variety to his game. I, I had a strange symmetry with, with Bill because I played against him his first game and I played against him his last game. Oh, really? When he played, you know, the, the Celtics, Celtics Lakers in, in 87, that was his last game. So, you know, we, we have this symmetry, but uh, Bill's an uh, uh, incredible player. And uh, that game that he played in the NC2A finals, uh, what was he? Memphis 20, State, 21-22. 21-20. Who's going to see that again, you know? Uh, when you hear Michael Jordan's the best player of all time, how do you react? Uh, I react by saying uh, those people probably didn't see Oscar Robertson play, and they 
they didn't see Jerry West play. Some of the guys that uh, played when the games weren't televised. But why aren't why aren't why isn't your name there? Uh, because people admire Michael's athletic, a, a extraordinary athletic ability, which is so obvious. And for me, they just see someone who's tall, and they they don't think I'm working that hard at it. But you know, I couldn't do what Michael did. Michael couldn't do what I did. So you know, it, we, that's just something people are going to argue about. From now until the yeah, end but of I time. think you're shortchanged, though. I am, but you know that's, that's <laughs> <laughs> you are. That's the way it goes. You know, people uh, sometimes. Uh, what? How do they say it? Um, the appearance of something it really takes on a reality of its own that that really isn't justified. You made it look too easy. Yeah, and I, being I, tall, that that's unfair. You should be doing this. I always compare myself in that sense uh, to Roberto Clemente. You know, he made it oh, look man. easy, and he did some incredible things out there uh, that people can can only think about. And uh, I, I I think um, we we were cursed the same way. How often do you hear airplane quoted when you see people? If we walk down the street, would you would somebody quote the movie Airplane? No, but if we go through the airport, <laughs> we will. Everybody. Everybody in the airline industry watches that We, we need that to film. dress you up, Kareem, as the captain and walk through an airport. Like uh, a Funny or Die video. You know, Bob Hayes and I did a, a, a piece for the Wisconsin Tourist Board where we fly around Wisconsin and point out interesting things there uh, for, for, for people to come visit uh, Wisconsin. And it, we, we mimicked uh, airplane. It's, uh, it's kind of perennial. Um, I can tell you a, a funny story. I was flying in Europe... I, I believe it was Lufthansa, and we're taxiing out to get ready to take off. And the pilot comes out and says, come here. And I'm like, you know, we were all strapped in. We were so, <laughs> he said, no, come, come with me. So I, I go into the, into the cockpit, and it was one of those wide-body planes that had extra seats for the pilots. He said, come on, sit here. And they strapped me in. They said, we're going to tell everybody that we flew with Murdoch. <laughs> <laughs> and so I... We we take off and then they let me go back to my seat, but they were thrilled about it, you know. And stewardesses, they want to talk about, it. you know, they they make jokes about it. It's uh, it's more or less something that the the airline industry is. It, it's their movie. He's uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the Hall of Famer, the greatest scorer in NBA history, six-time NBA champ. They somehow leave that out when they mention Jordan's six titles. They forget to mention that uh, Kareem has six as well. November 3rd, 10 Eastern, 10 Pacific, HBO airing Kareem, Minority of One, a documentary focusing on the life and career of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. What a life, what a career. Thanks for joining us, Kareem. It's a pleasure, I Dan. appreciate Th that. Thanks for having me. Thank you.